This program is brought to you by Emory University. We begin with Professor Stanley Hauerwas, whom Time Magazine called America's best theologian. He serves as McDonald Distinguished Professor and Gilbert T. Rowe Professor of Theological Ethics Emeritus at Duke University. A brilliant and courageous ethicist, theologian, and philosopher, Professor Hauerwas has been a pioneer in the construction of virtue theory and in the development of a theology that emphasizes the embodiment and exemplification of Christian teachings in the lives of individuals and institutions that would dare take on that precious name of Jesus Christ. And he has been a prophet of the Anabaptist and ascetic traditions of Christian thought. He has stood at more than 350 distinguished lecterns around the world, including delivery of the prestigious Gifford Lectures in 2001. He has directed, by my count, 154 dissertations, and most of his students are now leaders of the next generation of theologians, philosophers, and ethicists around the world. And he has published 600-plus articles, 50-plus books, including award-winning titles like A Community of Character, Resident Aliens, After Christendom, and Christianity, Democracy, and the Radical Ordinary. It's an extraordinary privilege for me to welcome to this lectern and to introduce to you the Alonzo McDonald Distinguished Scholar and Professor, Stanley Harawas. Thank you so much, John. Um, and Alonzo, it's wonderful to be a representative of, of your great uh, contributions to keeping serious Christian reflection alive in modern research universities. I assume I'm here as a representative of that most modern of atheists, namely those who do not believe in inalienable rights. I take it to be a mark of our times that a theologian may have worries about whether God exists, but we cannot call into, the question, call into question the status of rights. The language of rights bloomed after World War II in response to the absence of what seemed any unifying political ideologies or religious belief systems necessary to bind individuals together. Rights are, therefore, regarded as a source of ethical and political value that was and is capable of binding people together short of violence. The language of rights became and remains the language of high humanism, many think necessary to sustain peace in a fragmented world. Therefore, to be a critic of rights is close to putting oneself on the side of terrorism. I, uh, for example, some suggest that the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhuman Degrading Treatment, a convention of 1987, uh, is a crucial example of the importance of the developments of rights language. It seems if we did not have the language of rights, we might, it seems, to lack the necessary moral presumptions for a condemnation of torture. Governmental and non-governmental agencies make frequent appeals to this convention in support of political prisoners and their families around the globe. Accordingly, rights as ideals and principles form a basis for liberal democracies that have assumed a value and authority without precedent in the history of the world. It's hard to imagine why anyone, particularly someone like myself committed to nonviolence, would have any hesitation concerning appeals to rights. Yet I do have reservations, which interestingly, interestingly enough involve how one thinks about torture. I will develop my, my worries as a broadside, but let me put it succinctly this way. If you need a theory of rights to know that torture is wrong, or if you think you need rights to ground your judgments that torture is morally wrong, then something has clearly gone wrong with your moral sensibilities. What follows is my attempt to defend that remark um, by giving you a list of what I regard as some of the disabilities associated with rights language. I can illustrate what I mean by suggesting that rights language has become too powerful. 
by calling attention to a remark of someone who I believe was in the Department of Justice during the Civil Rights Campaign in Mississippi. Several civil rights workers had been killed. The spokesman for the Department of Justice was appropriately outraged. In order to express his outrage, he resorted to the moral vocabulary in which he most felt at home. He said that those who had been killed had had their rights violated. When rights become a more basic moral description than murder, you have an indication that your language has gone on a holiday. Of course, one cannot help but have sympathy with, uh, for the Department of Justice representative. He was using the most significant language he knew to indicate what a horrible moral crime had been committed. Yet the very appeal to the violation of rights as a fundamental moral description may indicate a profound worry about such a morality. For if confidence in the language of rights is lost, it is not clear what the alternative to nihilism will be. I worry, therefore, that, no, that for no doubt many reasons, some are trying to make the language of rights do more work than it is capable of doing. Not that long ago, one of the fundamental issues that characterized that strange activity called metaethics was whether right or good was the primary ethical notion on which all other ethical judgments could be justified. That fruitless debate was, of course, an attempt to choose between Mill and Kant on strictly logical grounds. The challenge to that way of understanding ethics was represented by philosophers such as Bernard Williams, Iris Murdoch, Philippa Foote, Alistair McIntyre, and Ray Gaetia, who directed attention to words such as kindness, honesty, gentleness, as descriptions at least as important as the big words right and good. I'm trying to make a similar point about rights. Not unrelated to the overdetermination of rights language in our current moral vocabulary is my worry that once the language of inalienable rights is introduced, there's no way to control their multiplication. Once rights are divorced from the practices that they depend upon for their intelligibility, they multiply faster than rabbits. I may well think I have a right to my body, but it's not clear how that claim can be commensurate with a people who think suicide is wrong. If I have a right to my body, does that mean, as some seem to think, that I have a right to end my life when I so desire? Not only does the unlimited scope of rights language seem uncontrollable once the cat of an inalienable rights is let out of the bag, there's no way it seems to adjudicate mutually exclusive rights claims. The assumption that I have a right to my body is not that different from someone who thinks they have an unlimited right to their money. The moral life conceived primarily in terms of rights turns out to produce people who end up shouting to one, at one another by claiming that their rights have been violated. John Milbank observes, for example, if rights for women only mean that women are to receive their respective shares of use in relationship to men and children, then the notion of woman's rights as self-possession can rebound to a further oppression of women. For example, if only women have rights over the fetus, Milbank suggests, then men as men will naturally exercise their implied equivalent rights to have nothing to do with childbearing or the nurture of children. My other worry about rights language is the moral psychology that is often presumed by those that use that language. It was not by accident when I originally came, in term, came to terms with some of the problems with rights was in testimony before the Congressional Committee on Experimentation with Children. In a theory of justice, John Rawls had admirably acknowledged that at least in relationship to animals, his account of justice did not require those lacking a capacity for a sense of justice were owed strict justice. Rawls is clearly making a point about his understanding of justice but many draw a similar conclusion about the capacity that must be present in order to claim rights. The Congressional Committee, therefore, had trouble explaining why it was we should protect children against experimentation because children did not have the moral psychological capacity to claim rights. Questions of the moral psychology necessary to claim rights are particularly important for how one thinks about the morality of abortion. 
If the fetus lacks the characteristics necessary to be a person and is therefore not capable of being a rights bearer, does that mean that abortion does not need to be justified? Or even more radical, if the fetus lacks the capacity to claim rights, do we need the language of abortion at all? Termination of pregnancy is a description that seems perfectly adequate if the fetus has no rights. Of course, termination of pregnancy suggests that this is purely a medical procedure that raises no moral questions at all. Finally, I worry that the language of rights has not been, th been thought through theologically. In particular, it is not clear what the implications of the language of rights has for our relationship to God. Rights seem to suggest we may well have a standing over against God that betrays what it may mean to be a creature. Such a stance may not be without theological justification, but it surely demands more reflection than it has been given. It is to Nick Walkerstorff's great credit that he's addressed this issue straight on by arguing that the Imago, the Imago Dei entails that, the claim that because we are loved by God, we have a bestowed worth that grounds our claim to have rights even if we seem to lack the capacity for such a claim. Walter Storff may well be right that no purely secular accounts of rights is possible, but I find his correlative claim, namely that God has a right, simply bizarre. Such is my bill of particulars against the language of rights. I need to emphasize that I am not calling into question all appeals to rights. There's no question that claims about human rights have served to challenge forms of human oppression. David Gushy is surely right to suggest that Christians should celebrate recent advances in international human rights law in which the smallest individual has been given protection from the greatest ruler. Yet even that achievement is not without problems because it's not clear a claim to have a right makes sense without a mechanism that it can enforce that right. I've described what I've just given you as a broadside attack on rights. In order to defend that broadside, I want to call attention to Simone Weil's account of rights. In particular, I want to direct attention to a set of her remarks about rights in a remarkable essay, Human Personality. This essay, like all of Weil's work, was published after her death in 1950, but it seems to have been written in 1943. It now appears in her selected essays, 19, 1934 through 43. She begins the essay by observing that something is amiss when the vocabulary of personalism, just to the extent that what is sacred in each of us, is not our personhood, but that we are who we are and not someone else. What makes us and others sacred is not our generalized humanity, but everything about us, the whole of us, our arms, our thoughts, our eyes that give us a history. This understanding of the sacred character of our lives is the background that, she, that makes intelligible Vey's remarks about rights that I think is particularly important. She said, if you say to someone who has ears to hear, what you are doing to me is not just, you may touch and awaken at its source the spirit of attention and love. But it is not the same with words like, I have the right, or you have the right. They evoke a latent war and awaken the spirit of contention. To place the notion of rights at the center of social conflicts is to inhibit any possible impulse of charity on both sides. Relying almost exclusively on this notion, it becomes impossible to keep one's eyes on the real problem. If someone tries to browbeat a farmer to sell his eggs at a moderate price, the farmer can say, I have a right to keep my eggs if I don't get a good enough price. But if a young girl is being forced into a brothel, she will not talk about her rights. In such a situation, the word would sound ludicrously inadequate. Thus it is that social drama, which corresponds to the latter situation, is falsely assimilated by the use of the words rights to the former one. 
Thanks to this word, what should have been a cry of protest from the depth of the heart has been turned into a shrill nagging of claims and counterclaims, which is both impure and unpractical. What I find particularly interesting about these remarks of Vey is her examples. The farmer has every right not to sell his eggs. His claim to possess such a right depends on the thick network of relationships and habits that make him the farmer he is. He does not have to sell his eggs because his neighbors will understand why he refuses to sell at a reduced price. To claim his right not to sell is to locate the farmer in a network of relations and narratives that give intelligibility to the farmer's practices. It is the very mediocrity, Vail's word, of the rights to which the farmer appeals that make his declaration to have rights intelligible. Yet the mediocre character of the appeal to rights by the farmer, according to Vey, is the reason that an appeal to rights by a young girl being forced into a brothel does not do justice to the seriousness of the wrong being done to her. It does not help, according to Vey, to try to raise the stakes by suggesting that her personal rights are being violated. Indeed, to add the word personal to rights is only to make matters worse. It is not, Vail argues, her personality that is being violated, but her very being. Vey expands her remarks about the personal by suggesting to add the language of personal to qualify rights only makes the cry of the oppressed even meaner than bargaining. It does so because it inflects the call of justice with the tone of envy. She observes that to, de to the dimmed understanding of our age, the claim that all should have an equal share of privilege does not seem odd. Yet the claim is both absurd and base because privilege is by definition a matter of inequality and base because what is claimed to be worth having is not worth having. In fact, the kinds of people who formulate such claims are in a privileged position, which makes them presume that they have a monopoly on the language of rights. They are the last people, therefore, who should say that privilege is unworthy to be desired. Remember, Vey is no defender of injustice. It is important to remember Vey's profound sympathy, sympathy for those who worked in factories. In fact, she closely identified with those who worked at such tasks, even trying to join them in similar work. But she argued that to put in the mouth of the afflicted words described as coming from the vocabulary of middle values, words such as democracy, rights, and personality, is to offer the afflicted that which can bring them no good and will inevitably do, mu do them much harm. It is the language of truth, beauty, justice, compassion they need, not the language of rights. Vey worries about the use of rights language by those she identifies as the afflicted. is based on her judgment that the notion of rights is linked with the notions of exchange and measured quantity. In short, the language of rights has a commercial ring that is evocative of law courts and arguments. Accordingly, rights are colored with the tone of contention. Such a tone, however, if it is to be serious, must rely on force if its claim to rights is not to be laughed at. The rights depend on force, but a that, right, that rights depend on force is but a reminder that rights are originally the creation of the Romans, and in particular, from Roman property owners. It is important, moreover, to remember that the property that Roman owners owned were human beings. They is not denying that rights have no moral standing. Rather, her worry is that rights, which she identifies with being launched into the world in 1789, have proved unable to fulfill the role assigned to them. They have been unable to secure the sacredness of each human being because the sacred can only be secured by the good. It is this profound and childlike and unchanging expectation of good in the heart is, not, is what is involved in when we agitate for our rights. 
There is therefore no guarantee for the protection of life against the collectivities unless the disposition of public life understands how itself manifests a relationship to the higher good. What I find so compelling about Vey's understanding of rights is her refusal to turn rights into an abstraction. The language of rights has its place, but that place requires the display of thick human relationships. Vey begins her great book, The Need for Roots, by observing the notion of obligations come before of rights. Obligations come before rights because for a right to be effectual, it cannot spring from the individual who possesses it. Rather, the efficacy of a right depends on other people who consider themselves to be under certain obligations toward the one that claims the right. An obligation that goes unrecognized is still an obligation, but a right which is unrecognized by anyone, they wryly observes, is not worth very much. They argues it is nonsense to say that we have rights and obligations as if those possessions have the same status. The relation between obligations and rights is that between object and subject, which means that a person considered in isolation only has duties, some of which will be duties to themselves. A person left alone in the universe would have no rights, but they still have obligations. They would have obligations because obligations, unlike rights, uh, they would have obligations um, uh, because obligation, unlike rights, are independent of conditions in which they are expressed. In contrast, rights are always to be found related to particular conditions. That is what the revolutionaries of 1789 did not recognize. Namely, they failed to see the contradiction entailed by their asserting of their rights and yet at the same time wanting to prostitute absolute principles. In effect, they confuse that which is eternal and unconditioned with that which is conditioned by facts. From Vey's perspective, we have been paying the moral and political price for the confusions by, by that confusion by trying to make rights do more than they were able to do. For Vey, for another human being, for Vey, respect for another human being cannot be grounded in rights, but rather is reflections of our obligations that make us human. The object of any obligation is the human being as such because the very reason such an obligation exists is because we are just that, human. Such an obligation has no foundation but is verified in the common con consent found in our behavior toward one another. The recognition of such an obligation in particular cases can be expressed to be sure in a confused and imperfect way by calling uh, attention to positive rights. That recognition of such obligations, however, depends not on claims to possess rights, but the recognition of our common humanity. The introduction of the language of needs makes clear that they and most defenders of rights in our time have radical different understandings of what it means to be a human being. For they, the need for roots is basic because as creatures destined for eternal life, we will discover that, de that destiny through needs is basic as order, liberty, obedience, responsibility, equality, hierarchism, honor, punishment, freedom of opinion, security, risk, private property, collective property, and truth. For they, basic needs of our bodies creates conditions that makes possible our being rooted in forms of life that make respect for ourselves and the other possible. Rights are simply reminders for that kind of obligation. I want to conclude by elaborating on this last remark about the importance of the body for the discipline of our language of rights by calling attention to Rowan Williams' recent reflections on rights. Williams develops this understanding of rights in response to McIntyre's claim in After Virtue that human rights like unicorns simply do not exist. Williams thinks McIntyre is surely right that the standoff between rights and utility in our culture has resulted in a managerial account of political life in which experts are now given authority in a manner that inhibits the arguments we need to have 
to discover goods in common. But Williams does not think that means all rights talk is to be left behind, exactly because rights is now one of the resources we have for challenging the assumption that the modern state can do whatever it pleases. In defense of rights, Williams calls attention to the uneasy relationship of Christians with slavery. Slavery was not condemned in scripture and the early church obviously included in the ranks of the church slave owners as well as slaves. But the relationship between the slave owner and the slave, Williams observes, was complicated by baptism. Because of baptisms, Christians could not view their bodies or the bodies of their fellow Christians as property. Indeed, the body became the medium of the meaning for what it meant for us to have a soul exactly because it is the body that is the medium in which the conscious subject communicates and there is no communication without it. Sounding very much like Simone Weil, Williams argues that the recognition of a body as a human body is, fundamentally, is fundamental for the recognition of another's rights. It is so because to recognize the body of another human being, a body that roots us in life, is to recognize the body as a vehicle of communication. Though he does not reference Herbert McCabe, Williams focuses on the significance of the body in a manner quite similar to Herbert McCabe's stress on the significance of the body to make communication possible. For example, McCabe observes that it is because I have this sort of body, a human body living with a human life, that my communication can be linguistic. The human body is a source of communication. I call attention to the similarity between Williams and McCabe because both insist that the body is not an instrument of communication, but rather the body is an but rather the, the human body is intrinsically communicative. Accordingly, ethics is but the study of human behavior as communication. Williams argues that this understanding of the communication the body makes possible has the advantage of not grounding rights in an account of human dignity in which dignity is associated with having certain capacities. Such accounts, as I observed above, cannot, ha cannot ha help but have the result of excluding some from being regarded as having rights. The body as a human body is a system of communication which is by no means is rational or even verbal, Williams argues, is basic for why we should want to speak of rights at all. For constitutive of the routine act of communication is the doctrine of our shared obedience to Christ based in our bodily nature through baptism. That doctrine affirms that the body of every person is related to its maker and savior before it is related to any human system of power. Accordingly, we have an identity that cannot be taken over by any other person's will. That holds true, moreover, of those that lack the means to communicate other than their body. Williams, therefore, maintains that if he is right about the communicative character of our embodiment, then it is the inviolability of the body that is the basis for giving us some way to talk about rights in appropriate context. Rights belong not to the person who has a rational capacity, but rather rights can be attributed to any organism that can be recognized as a human body within its interrelation with other bodies. This view of the body, moreover, draws on the Christian presumption that as a community of beings, a bearer of a message cannot be silenced. The dignity accorded to another is not in recognition that they may be better than they seem, but rather is a recognition that, they, that what they have to say may be a gift from God. Williams argues, therefore, that the language of rights is not a language that lends itself to revolution, to resolution in purely secular terms. For in secular terms, the language of rights cannot help but become a supreme and non-contestable concept that overwhelms the concepts we use, we need for communication. Appealing to Sabina Loverbond's use of Wittgenstein-inspired arguments in realism and imagination, Williams argues that there comes a point when argument comes to an end and we must recognize that a level has been reached that is basic if we are to think at all. To speak of non-negotiable rights is the attempt to say that we've not chosen these commitments, but rather they make our very ability to speak 
one a, but a possibility. Williams concludes that it's unlikely that the political and legal philosophy used to sustain the language of rights will converge with the theological framework he's just developed. At the very least, that means that we should not presume that claims about inalienable rights have a firm foundation. As an alternative, Williams suggests that the language of human rights should be regarded as an aspect of our culture. Such a culture may be called the culture of dignity, indicating the outworking of a habit of accepting a wider acknowledgement of belonging. For Williams, the language of human rights becomes confused and possibly dangerous when it's divorced from the questions of such belonging and recognition in terms of specific practices. Those questions, moreover, cannot be explored in the abstract, but in the concrete give and take between bodies rooted in particular histories and traditions. Therefore, I see no reason why Christians should refrain from, on a selective basis from using rights language as part of our moral toolkit. We do so, however, with modesty, for the appeal to rights depends on concrete practices that are more determinative than when right-making claims are used as ends in themselves. Rights, I think, are best understood as reminder claims to help us remember the thick moral relations our bodies have made possible. I do not think, however, that the language of rights needs to be justified or grounded theologically. We do not need to justify or ground the use of concepts such as kindness for helping us name how Christians should live. Why should we need uh, such a theory about rights to show that they are so grounded. That would only be the case if rights are mistakenly assumed to be more basic than kindness that should be constitutive of the virtue of charity. The question is not can Christians appeal to rights, but rather whether our moral vocabulary is in good enough condition that such appeal does not threaten to determine everything we have to say. And that's all I have to say about rights. Thank you very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.